a good day to you folks. It's a philosophy, a philosophy roulette number 88 where we uh, grab some philosophy and read it and review it. It's good times. So let's see what we got today. What's new? I did a nice paper from philosophy and uh, literature. And there's a, what was this? Something over here. Philosophy and literature yesterday. That was kind of fun because I've been reading all this technical work. And... I mean, oh, agriculture and human values, you are always publishing. But uh, the technical work, it does grind on you a little bit because it's uh, the language is just sort of jarring. It, it reflects the underlying uh, formalistic uh, systems. So, uh, Let's see, what do we got? Oh, I think I looked at this stuff. This is a... Uh, Hmm, yeah, these are, uh, reviews or whatever, uh, like, uh, this is a, uh, microbiome causality uh, special article, so these are, uh, I think, uh, surveys or whatever, so, this is one to five, isn't it, I think, further reflections is like the wrap-up paper on the, uh, on the symposium or whatever it was. Oh, that's not it. Sorry. Oh, down here. Nothing. Okay. Yeah, I looked at this the other day. It's too bad. I'd like to uh, grab something from uh, philosophy and biology or whatever. Biology and philosophy, excuse me. Yeah, see. Another four-page paper. Hey, maybe it's a if it's double column. Maybe it's not as short as I think it is. So let's take a look. See if this one's available. Nope. Okay. There's a review. Let's see. Response to Milstein. Roberta Milstein. Let's see it. Let's see. Dagnabbit. Okay. Well, it's very hard to read papers if they're not available. Let's see if anything's forthcoming. Um. Let's see, there's 115 downloads, so maybe it's available, but it, usually things are a little too long for me to read. Let's just see how many pages this happens to be. Uh, it was a critical notice. Okay, I'm not going to read a critical notice. Alright, so no biology and philosophy for today. That is unfortunate because I can't find anything. Classical Quarterly. You know, I feel like I should go back to the philosophy and literature uh, place, but let's see. Um, what is this classical? Oh. Look at all these short papers. Um, I wonder what this is. Why are there so many, like, two-page papers? What does this journal do? Oh, who am I to complain? I'll just grab the first one, or the second one, whatever it was. Oh my god, am I gonna have to read Latin? What is this? This is interesting, whatever it is. I don't know what this is. Uh, I mean, at least, you know, when they're doing the, uh, when I read something that was like from Chinese stuff, they at least give you the English translation because they assume you don't read Chinese, but it looks like these people just assume you read ancient Greek. Oh dear. Alright, this is like scaring me really. The Spacian's the Apotheosis. Let's see what that is. Four pages. Uh, let's see, what do we got? Come on. Oh. Alright, sorry, Classical Quarterly. I'm getting tired of this. 
Yeah, I'm not doing science papers. Contemporary Buddhism. Protecting stunts in terms of climate change on Mars and Earth. Well, I don't know anyone else worrying about climate change on Mars at the moment, but I am willing to take a look. Fifteen pages, a little long. Uh, city of Nibba, Nibbana. Uh, Fifteen pages. No, not doing that. Anyone out in the watching has a. Uh, Suggestions, please give them. I will take a look. Uh, let's see. It's forthcoming in our Kentness. Uh, did I do this one? I think I did. Yeah, or I looked at it. It was too long. Uh, 15 pages. I think shorter, please. Structure of language, 1 to 15, 1 to 14. I don't know why it makes so many of these. Takes more to answer existence questions. I read that one. 1 to 13. Indeterminism in physics, classical chaos, Bohmian mechanics. Are real numbers really real? Is a criterion analytic? I read that one. That was a nice paper. Let's see if they get anything else over that. Oh, cool. An eight page paper. I have to at least try to take a look. Continuously nine pages. Let's see. What else do we have? Chalmers' argument from relativity. Come on, let's be there. One to six. I could really like a one to six right now. Woo! Nope. On note on shapes. This is not the right things. Although journal of philosophical research. Wait, is this it? Huh. Okay, so this is a different paper from that person on shapes. And, uh... Let's see, is this the right paper or the wrong paper? Let's find out. No, this is the one on shapes. Okay. So, this is... But it's also on, um... Special Theory of Relativity. So, this is not the right one on... This is not the right paper. This is the uh, wrong paper on the right topic. <laughs> okay, I have to get going on this. I'm like sitting around like trying to find a paper. Oh. Alright, so we got nine pages single spaced we got some logic uh too much yeah no there's too much logic because i'm gonna be able to box implies this and box implies that that's not um comfortable to read oh well here we go we got person good for, thank you adam podlaskowski so this is what we're gonna do because it's here If you join me live and you want to grab the uh, link to the uh, this page, you, you just type exclamation point in uh, exclamation point paper in the chat box, and uh, then you get that. Uh, the link will pop back up. Oh, you only uploaded your abstract. I take back everything nice I said about you, Adam. I'm sorry. Well, let's see. Maybe it's. Uh... Nope. All right. That's. Uh, are not unhinged. Maybe they are. Transfer principles. No more transfer principles. All right. Nope. Not much. All right, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go to fill archive because this is almost. These all have to be here. I've not done a synthesis paper, so there we go. 
Okay, Knowledge and Cancel Ability by Tamo Lesso. And I hope I didn't speak too soon again. Okay, hooray! Okay, here we go. Knowledge and Cancelability by Tama Losau. No abstract. A major point of discussion in the recent debate about knowledge descriptions has, to be, has been to what extent our intuitions about their felicity may be due to pragmatic implications. Okay, pragmatic implications about knowledge descriptions. That's what we're talking about. I take the main positions in the debate to be the following. Attribu attributor contextualism. The semantic truth conditions of knowledge descriptions depend on the context in which the knowledge description is uttered, the speaker's context, and these account for the vast majority of our intuitions. Um, yeah, I just was thinking about this not too long ago. What is it? It's from, uh, like, the 50s, uh, this theory, the contextualist stuff. A relativism. The semantic truth conditions of knowledge descriptions depend on the context of assessment, the intuitor's context, and this explains our intuitions. Okay, so it's um the intention of the uh, intuitor's context, so it's something on their intention. Alright, and third, fallibistic pragmatic invariantism, FPI. The semantic truth conditions of knowledge ascriptions are invariant and require a fallibility fallibilist standard of justification that is often met by us. In context with high standards, including skeptical context, pragmatic strengthening leads to intuitions that may oh, this is another one under this intuitions that many knowledge descriptions are false, although semantically they are still true. And then we got infallibilistic pragmatic invariantism, which is the, I guess, opposite of fallibilistic pragmatic invariantism. Knowledge descriptions semantically require absolute certainty to count as semantically true. In most contexts, this requirement is pragmatically weakened, which explains why we often intuitively take many knowledge descriptions as true, to be true. Okay. In this paper, I argue that data on cancelability supports IPI, this last one. In particular, there is an asymmetry in which aspects of the conveyed content can be canceled. We cannot cancel the implication that the subject, the knower, is in a position of higher absolute certainty, but we can cancel the implication that she is in an imperfect epistemic state. Okay, interesting. So there's some sort of imperfect epistemic state. We have to find out what that is. The former is a well-known problem for FPI due to Keith DeRose and Stuart Cohen, but the latter, and in particular the arising asymmetry, have not been discussed at great length. I argue this symmetry is also problematic for contextualism and relativism insofar as they lack a convincing explanation of it. The best attempt at such an explanation is to appeal to some form of Lewis Lewisian rule, at rule of attention, but I will argue this attempt fails. Let me begin by revising the problem for FPI, which will help make the asymmetry clearer. Fallibilist, pragmatic invariants such as Jessica Brown, Patrick Rizu, Jeff Pinn, and Alexander Dings claim that knowledge descriptions are semantically true under conditions that require only reasonably good epistemic standing of the subject, plus of course the truth of the embedded proposition. While this is in accordance with most everyday uses of knowledge, as justified true belief, so annoying. Why do people still think justified true belief is a worthwhile way to go? It's just because we have nothing else. They're like, well, let's fall back to the thing we know is wrong. No, we know it's wrong. It's, it's wrong. Like, no one... Get here, like, stomped on it so bad that people don't even know what to say. Hi, Ikara Deka. <sighs> Talking about some uh, knowledge descriptions today. All right. While this is in accordance with most everyday uses of knowledge descriptions, in some contexts we seem to require more than that of a subject to count as known. In particular, it seems that we don't allow anyone to know anything about the external world in skeptical context, that is, context like a philosophical discussion about Descartes' meditations. Um, I read philosophy papers um, and comment on them, so we're talking about this one about uh, knowledge and uh, knowledge attributions, so like, what can we do? 
uh, what, what can we talk about? So, this is what I'm up to right now. Um, yeah, so just feel free to ask questions if you want, or anything else. If you want, grab the uh, paper that I'm reading. You can type an exclamation point paper in the chat box and you can see what I'm talking about. <sighs> Champions of FPI argue that this is because when used in such a context, the knowledge descriptions are pragmatically strengthened so that they pragmatically imply that the subject is in perfect epistemic standing, a standing that she could in fact not be in. Ah, uh, sorry, no, I'm, I'm like a philosopher. It's cool. So yeah, I, write, I read philosophy papers, not uh, scripts. A standing that she could, in fact, not be in. The idea often is that if the speaker was taken to assert simply the semantic content of the knowledge description, she would be claiming something irrelevant, and therefore participants of the conversation interpret the utterance as a stronger claim. Thus, FPI ends up making very similar claims as contextualists about the conveyed content, but maintain invariable and, achieve tr and achievable truth conditions at the semantic level. All right. Let me just double check I got this. Okay, makes some sense here. <sighs> A problem for this account is that the pragmatic strengthening that the pragmatic strengthening FPI claims lack a feature typically associated with pragmatic implication. They are not explicitly cancelable. To explicitly cancel a pragmatic implication P is stated something like, but I do not mean to say that P. To a statement that carries a pragmatic implication that P without making the same statement to make it, without making the statement infelicitous. For example, I can say there is a gas station on the corner, but I do not mean to say that they sell petrol, which is whereas it is infelicitous to say there is a gas station around the corner, but I do not mean to say that it is around the corner. Uh, I mean, I guess you can. Yeah, you're canceling the implication from gas station that sells gas because maybe it uh is more of a uh maybe it's broken down or something that there is a gas station on the corner but it doesn't actually sell anything right now because it's closed but there's a gas station around the corner it does not you can't just cancel the corner to the corner only an implication of what you said up here which is uh, the pragmatic implication However, when we try to cancel what FPI claims is a pragmatic implication of knowledge description with respect to the subject's epistemic standing, we give rise to a so-called concessive knowledge attribution. For example, imagine a, in it, imagine a skeptical context in which I try to make the following statement. I know that I have hands, but I do not mean to say that I can rule out all possible errors. Okay, so we're back to more here. Rather than canceling a pragmatic implication, this utterance appears to be a contradiction. Even worse, this appears to be a feature of con concessive knowledge attributions in general. The best motivation of this is in Lewis 96. But if K CKAs appear contradictory, this means they fail to directly cancel the pragmatic implication. Rather, the apparent contradiction will even call into question the semantic content. Thus, FPI must claim pragmatic implications that are not explicitly cancelable. In response to this problem, my, an, an initial response to this problem might be to point out that KCAs can sometimes be felicitous. For example, we may say, KCA1, I know that they're going to lose, but I'm going to carry on watching just in case. KCA2, I know the opera starts at 8, but I don't mean to say that I can rule out being deceived by an evil demon. Dylan Dodd and Trent Doherty and Patrick Ricew discuss examples like KCA1 at some length. Dodd plausibly argues that KCA1, CKA1 amounts to asserting something along the lines, there is no chance they're going to, there is no chance they're not going to lose, but there's a small chance they're going to not lose. Um, you know, I wouldn't actually say that's what this means. Usually if you're, you're watching a losing match, it's not always to, uh, find out the outcome, you might actually just like the sport and want to see what happens to your players that you uh, follow. So there's other re ways of uh, parsing this out. I haven't read this literature, but you know, this is um, a pretty reasonable thing. Like you support your team also, like you're going to carry on watching, like you don't leave the game early because you don't, uh, you want to support the team to the end in some sense is also a sort of a, another thing that you might, might be going on there. Um, and if you say you know they're going to lose, you may, uh, of course, you might actually not, you might just be with high confidence, is what this is sort of saying here. 
He said KC1 is fallacious because the speaker is not committed to the truth of the statement. Yeah. The first half, first half of case CKA1 is uttered as hyperbole. Yep. Yeah. Or an expression of frustration. Similarly, CKA2 can be felicitous in a low stakes context because the speaker appears to be clarifying what information she is trying to convey, namely that they are sufficiently well informed but may not be prepared to defend their information against a radical skeptic. Yeah, so that maybe they're giving the sort of uh, terms of their knowledge or in terms of how they understand things, <coughs> how they cash out what they are you're con they're considering knowledge at the moment. However, once we ask whether the speaker really knows that the opera starts at 8, it appears that she is asserting a similar type of contradiction. Even in the low stakes context, the speaker appears to be expressing that it is both impossible and possible that the opera does not start at 8. Another attempt of objecting to the problem of FPI raised above might be that there plausibly are pragmatic implications that are not explicitly cancelable. But is this true? Grice, Paul Grice, thought that at least all conversational implic implicatures are explicitly cancelable. Even more, it may seem that all pragmatic implications, not just implicatures, are in fact cancelable as they are defeasible inferences just like conversational implicatures. If this is so, pragmatic implications claimed by FPI could not exist. However, some have tried to provide cases of convention conversational implicatures that are not explicitly cancelable. These cases rely on the fact that the cancellation will be subject to pragmatic alteration due to its obvious falsity which will often make the speaker sound ironical. The challenge here is to find a way of making the speaker's claim credible so that the pragmatic effects of the cancellation vanish. This may only be possible given the right setup of the conversation. In such a case, the pragmatic implications arguably remain contextually cancelable. That is, they would be cancelable given the right context, but they would not be explicitly cancelable in their original context. The following modification of one of Matthew Weiner's Original cases by Michael Blom Tillman illustrates this. Unbeknownst to Alice, who is sprawling over several seats on the recreation deck, Sarah and one of her engineering officers are testing a portable tractor beam. For the purposes at issue, the tractor beam has to be strong enough to make it poss impossible for Alice to make room for someone else to sit down next to her. After activating the beam, Sarah asks Alice via the intercom, Sarah, Alice, I'm curious as to whether it would be physically possible for you to make room for someone else to sit down. Alice baffled. Why should I? There's no one else here who wants to sit down. Sour. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to imply that you should make room. We're testing a new tractor beam on you, and we are curious as to whether you can do it. This would give us an important indication how strong the beam really is. Sarah's initial statement gives rise to the implicature that Sarah thinks Alice should make room, and Sarah would be conveying this in an ironical way. In most contexts, any attempt to cancel this implicature would only add to the irony. However, in this specific context, Alice is, is able to cancel the implicature. Yeah, this is a rather odd sort of thing because the possibility here is um, uh, it's uh, there's modal ambiguity over here. What physically possible? Like yes, because she, she's saying physically possible, but really, um, and Alice takes it as um, like socially possible. Why would you bother? Uh, so. It's, uh, Alice doesn't understand that there is a physical, uh, the physical modality really matters here. So that's what the irony is, of course. Um, yeah, so. Weiner's cases may be challenged further as they seem to be relying on the practical difficulty of making the attempted cancellation credible to the hearer. However, for the sake of the argument, let us assume that there are cases of conversational implicatures that are not explicitly cancelable in certain contexts. Even then, it seems that FPI has trouble explaining the oddness of CKAs. First, the kind of exceptions that have been pointed out in the debate surrounding the cancelability test are very different from the ones FPI needs to rely on. The problem in these cases is to make the cancellation seem genuine and credible, and this explains why the cancellation fails. But it is easy for a speaker to convince us that they cannot rule out all possible errors without sounding ironical, so CKAs seem very different from those cases. Yeah, the iron irony is... Uh, there's an ambiguity that's being used there, and so it's like, if there's an ambiguity to begin with, you're not just going to get rid of it. Um, second, it seems that CKAs always appear contradictory, but given our discussion above, if FPI is correct, there should be at least some context in which they appear consistent. Third, advocates of FPI face the problem of explaining the contradictory appearance of CKAs in general, combined with the fact that strengthening the conveyed content of a knowledge description by way of claiming the stronger claim 
to be an implication is Felicis. I can say, S knows that P, and by this I mean that she can rule out all possible errors. The problem of explaining this asymmetry will be discussed in greater length below. Okay, but first let's get to a better view of that asymmetry itself. Yes, let's get somewhere. To do so, let's look why this problem does not apply to IPA. IPA traces back to ideas of Peter Unger and Jonathan Schaffer, and is championed by Herman Kaplan, Earl Coney, Wayne Davis, and Igor Duvin. The claim is that knowledge descriptions semantically express that the subject is in an ideal epistemic state with respect to the embedded proposition that is, she can rule out all possibilities of error. Of course, this is rarely the case, so outside of skeptical context, this statement will be pragmatically weakened so that it expresses something fit to the purpose of the conversation. For example, if the question is whether we have to go to the bank today, my saying I know that the bank is open tomorrow expresses that I'm certain enough about this to base our decision on it, but not that I can rule out deception by an evil demon, which obviously I cannot. Which I obviously cannot. Because of how rare skeptical contexts are, this pragmatic weakening occurs by default. These are what Rice would call generalized conversational implicatures. The, implica the implicatures in, place, in play here can be canceled for, for I can say, I know that the bank is open tomorrow, and by, this, and by this I mean that I am absolutely certain. There is not even a remote possibility of error. While such a statement is presumptuous, it does not seem to involve any kind of contradiction as CKAs do. It can also add less presumptuous statements of the form, and by this I mean I can even rule out that P, which does not itself make a claim of infallibility, but that, but do lead to a stronger statement than being conveyed. Yet. So it's like, you can say you rule out the obvious mistakes. You'd be like, look, I didn't make an obvious mistake. So that's kind of like the strengthening here. Um, so it's like, I know P and I, and it's not, and I know P because I can rule out X, Y, and Z, the most obvious mistakes of uh, where I might've gone wrong about this. Um, Anything else to say about this right here? No. All right, so we're just getting, we're just trying to get through the asymmetry here. The situation then is this. Given any knowledge description, the speaker can add a statement that strengthens the conveyed content up until the point of ascribing infallibility with respect to the embedded proposition to the subject. Um, up to the point of ascribing infallibility. I'm not sure we know where this point is. So the idea that we can, we can uh, go up to the point of infallibility um, is a little worrisome because it seems like some sort of a, you already know where this is. And so in, if you already know where the point of infallibility is, then, um, you've made further assumptions on the state of knowledge. So I'm a little worried about that. No big deal really, but there's something, uh, there's an assumption built in with that. However, the converse is not the case. It is infelicitous to add a statement to a knowledge description that is intended to weaken the conveyed content so that a lesser epistemic standing would be required of the subject to confirm the conveyed content. All right, what? So uh, you, you can't weaken your statement. Okay, this is a, that's Moore's paradox then. This is why the pra this is why any pragmatic strengthening of knowledge descriptions with respect to subject epistemic standing, which we could which we could claim would not be cancelable, whereas any pragmatic weakening of them would be. Um, <laughs> the, that's a hard statement. Okay, so far we have seen that this is a problem for FPI to, and does not apply to IPI, but I suggest that we ask a further question. What explains this feature of knowledge descriptions? Why can we add claims to knowledge descriptions that strengthen the conveyed content, but cannot do the same with claims that are intended to weaken the claim the conveyed content so it's like if you say you know something and then you say but i don't really know it then why do you say you know it? but you can say well i know something and then i actually strengthened it because here's how i know now there's a question here this is what i mean about ascribing infallibility um how do you know that actually when you start listing things you are actually strengthening it you are uh, probably listing them because you're worried about the people um not believing your word to begin with, and that's why you're actually, uh, you think you're strengthening, but that might actually be a weakening. Um, so like if you think you have to justify yourself, then the justification may actually be looking, to, may appear to be a form of weakening, not a uh, form of strengthening, because you're sort of like, uh, it's apolo apologizing for what you had to say. Okay, so if when you uh, think the apology is uh, a sign of weakness, then it could be.
Okay. So far, we have seen that there's a problem for FPI does not apply to IPA, but I suggest that we ask a further question. Well, sorry, I read this. Why can we exp why can we add claims to novel descriptions that strengthen the conveyed content but cannot do the same that are tend to weaken the conveyed content? IPI has an obvious explanation of this. It is because the former cancel pragmatic implications, which are always or almost always cancelable, whereas the latter attempt latter are attempts to cancel their semantic implication while also drawing attention to the semantic meaning, which gives rise to a contradiction. All right, so the pragmatic implication versus the semantic implication, here is the difference. It is also clear that the, our, the, it is also clear that other theories cannot make use of this explanation as they deny that this is the case. FPI is furthest from the claim that IPI offers as it involves the claim that pragmatic and semantic implications are often divided up conversely to how IPI claims they are. The more so, the weaker, the more so, the weaker the claim semantic meaning of knowledge. Oh, I, this is, this writing is, it's well written, it's just, it's sort of like backwards to how I think about it, so it's a, I'm, I keep a, flipping words around. The more so, the weaker the claimed semantic meaning of knowledge or description is. Yes, I don't really love this sentence right here. <laughs> but what about uh, but what about attributor context and relativism? Can they offer alternative explanations of this asymmetry? Contextual, contextualists such as Keith DeRose, Stuart Cohen, David Lewis, and more recently Michael Blong Tillman, Zoltano Gender Zabo, and Jonathan Schaffer and Jonathan Ekchikawa think that the semantic truth conditions vary with the context of attribution and that these determine the epistemic standing that is ascribed to the subject by the knowledge descriptions. Relativists such as John McFarlane makes similar claim, a similar claim that they think that it is the context of assessment which has this effect. Pragmatic effects on both views do not, or only to a less significant degree, alter which epistemic standing as is ascribed to the sub subject by the conveyed content. If the description of an epistemic standing is conveyed in virtue of the semantic meaning, this means that the semantic implications of knowledge description are cancelable, but only in one direction. That semantic implication can be cancelable is a controversial claim in itself, but I will here assume that it that this can be the case. Contextualists and relativists thus need to identify a feature of knowledge descriptions that account for the cancelability of those implications that involve the claims that the subject is in a weaker or less than perfect epistemic state, which does not lead to the predication that implications of the subject being in a stronger or perfect epistemic should also be cancelable. Okay, so under these other theories, why are we allowed to block certain, or why are we allowed to cancel certain things, but, um, not other ones so this is the symmetry that do these other ones so it's like why can you strengthen things but not weaken them so why is it okay to support what you uh, assert you know but not to uh, discount what you assert you know um and do they explain this uh norm i guess you could call it because we've had norms of assertion before that deal with similar similar stuff so do these other theories have a similar norm to explain why the best candidate for such features appears to be some version of Lewis's rule of attention. Lewis champions a relevant alternative theory according to which a subject needs to be able to rule out all relevant possibilities that entail non-P in order to count as knowing P. Uh, justify true belief. Gives me a headache. He spells out the notion of relevance by giving a tentative list of rules including the rule of attention. According to this rule, a possibility is always relevant if speakers in the context of attribution are currently attending to it. Note that this rule has a sister rule, uh, applicability, a sister rule applicable to relativism according to which attention by the subjects is in, in the context of assessment leads to relevance. So we've got a relevance rule here. All right. Relevance. Lewis points out that this rule explains the infelicity of concessive knowledge attributions by mentioning the fact that there are uneliminable possibilities or even pointing out certain possibilities we draw attention to possibilities and make these possibilities relevant this in turn leads to the knowledge description actually being false even though it might have been true had we not drawn attention to these possibilities so okay so this uh, rule here is um if you're tending you're, you bring attention to certain things you can't then discount the things you just brought attention to Okay. 
Similarly, the contextualist or relativist can claim that attempts to cancel a semantic implication of a subject being in a perfect or very good epistemic standing defy their own purpose by drawing attention in the context of attribution or in the context of assessment to possibilities the subject is or may be able to eliminate. Such attempts will only make the statement more clearly false as it guarantees these possibilities are being attended to. However, there is no such problem in canceling semantic implications of the subject being in a comparatively weak or less than perfect epistemic standing. These are guaranteed to work precisely because they point, the, point to potentially uneliminable, uneliminated possibilities of error making them immediately relevant. Okay, so the norm of assertion here is that you can point out, um, you can bring attention to things that strengthen your position but not ones that weaken them because why did you assert uh, the statement to begin with? So this is a norm of um, assertion, I guess, uh, in the other sort of lingo, norm lingo. Um, yeah, yeah, see, this is the thing, epistemics they identify their own purpose. So this is, um, what do you mean by purpose here? Um, this is where you'd get uh, the norm talk, but like their own norm by drawing attention to the possibilities where subject is unable to eliminate. So it'd be against the norm, so. Uh, you could have like th like the uh, concept of purpose um the why did you assert what was the norm of assertion there this is the purpose so that's why i'm going this way all right so the rule of attention thus would be precisely the kind of feature contextualists and relativists are looking for however it is implausible that knowledge descriptions really have this feature um yeah, but you see, I'm a little worried here because I think you can have this feature, not as a rule, um, not as Lewis may have said it, but there's the other folks that do have norms of attention, so, uh, norms of assertion. As, as among other, Michael Williams and Michael Blom Tillman have observed, the rule of attention makes it too easy to raise the standards of knowledge. Blom Tillman considers an example where one sees one's teenage son sneaking out of the house at night and, and tells him the next morning, I know you left the house yesterday. The son that objects that one may one may also just have dreamed this. Gaslighting your dad? Good luck. That never seemed to work for me. If the rule of attention is correct, that should then create a context in which it is false that one knows that the sun sneaked out. But it is implausible that the mere mentioning of a remote possibility can serve as, a, as the sun's defense here. In Lewis's terminology, one should intuitively still be allowed to properly ignore this possibility. Okay, so the norm is too strong. Well, see if it's a rule that you can anything counts. Then, um, why should anything count? I don't know, but well, uh, th thus the rule of attention as it stands is not a plausible feature of knowledge description. Therefore, cannot be, it cannot explain the asymmetry of which aspects their meaning are cancelable. Yeah, because it's too strong just as a rule, as a norm of a, uh, as a norm of assertion. It could work though because uh, that's uh, slightly different than a rule of attention. Like you have to attend to this other possibility even if it's remote, then that's a little too strong. But if it's a norm of assertion, um, then it's just a norm. You well, it's like, well, I can attend to that, but you're being stupid. That's a bad, that's a bad thing. I don't have to attend to that. So you have to uh, grade these things in some way. Yeah, can it be fixed? Probably. Can we fix the rule of attention? Maybe mere attention is not enough to make a possibility become relevant because we need a notion of warranted attention. Yes, yes. But if this is the case, we no longer have a feature that explains why any attempt to wait, weaken the conveyed account of a knowledge description is infelicitous. Um, yeah. For example, it still seems wrong to tell one son, I know you left the house yesterday, but I cannot rule out that I just dreamed this. Well, that's, yeah, why would you say it then? Maybe the speaker herself needs to embrace the possibility in some way. But then it seems that two speakers within the same conversation can have different truth conditions for their knowledge descriptions, which seems indep independently implausible. Maybe attending to an uneliminated possibility can make a knowledge description less problematic in some way without making it false. But this seems to fly in the face of the contextualist or relativist strategy as it introduces an important non-semantic feature governing our judgments of felicity. Distinguishing semantic and non-semantic features governing those judgments in this way would also seem ad hoc as there is no indication that these judgments are caused in different ways. <sighs> yeah, okay. Th there's ways to explain this, yeah. 
think there are. Um, there's like perspectival versions of uh, knowledge description. So given the same perspective, I mean, the per, uh, common perspective, then you might be able to do a little bit more work in here. Um, not uh, where is that thing they just said? The, the same kind of kind of different truth conditions. Um, So, I mean, this is, there's arguments uh, along this, like in here, like stuff you could say about this sort of things, um, that there are, I mean, there are conditions for the sort of uh, having, it's not really just context, it's sort of like the uh, people themselves have sort of a standard of conversation. And so you wouldn't say this in this context because you wouldn't tell your son that you might just have dreamed it unless you think you're hallucinating. but. Otherwise, it would be violating some sort of a father-son relationship there. Why would you say that sort of thing when you're criticizing your son for uh, sneaking out at night? So there's other sort of uh, things at, place, at play in that sort of example. Okay. All there are alternative strategies for an, expl for an explanation of the asymmetry. Back to the why can you strengthen something you're saying but not weaken something you're saying. I'm not of any, aware of any other resources, but one might be able, might well take up the task of finding one. In general, what contextualists and relativists need is a future that privileges the infa infallibilist perspective so that walking away from it will be infelicitous, whereas walking towards it is fine. However, it seems that the problem of the rule of attention generalized. If it is held that the attempted cancellation can change the truth conditions of the knowledge description itself, as it is without the cancellation, then it seems to become too easy to raise the standards of knowledge, at least insofar as this feature can either be exploited to betray the purpose of the conversation or is not applicably wide enough to do the all the explanatory work. If this feature does not affect the truth conditions, we are moving away from the contextualism or relativism respectively and owe an explanation why this exception of the strategy accounting for judgments of felicity through semantic truth conditions is warranted. Sure, that's what kind of what I was saying because I stopped making uh, the not contextualist or relativist um, what I was saying earlier. I do not take these to be decisive considerations why such a feature could not exist, but rather reasons why we, in the absence of a convincing proposal, can legitimately assume that it does not. If that is so, contextualism and relativism lack an explanation of the asymmetry regarding which aspects of the conveyed content of knowledge ascription can be cancelled. So to sum up, there is an asymmetry with respect to which aspects of the conveyed content of a knowledge description regarding the subject's epic standing can be cancelled. IPI has a straightforward explanation of this phenomenon. Phenomenon, as is typically the case, we can cancel the pragmatic aspect, but not the semantic ones. FPI is committed to the problematic claim that the semantic aspects can be canceled, but at least some of the pragmatic aspects cannot. Contextuals and relativists are not committed to non-cancelable pragmatic aspects, but they lack an explanation of why certain groups of semantic aspects of meaning is cancelable, but other and one other one is not. It also seems that there are general obstacles to providing such an explanation. While there are, of course, many other important arguments on both sides that need to be addressed, the situation regarding cancelability then provides some support for infallibilist pragmatic invariantism. Okay, that was um, tough to read for me, but it was a good paper. Um, I have, like, some... I feel like the issue here is... Uh, this is taking the cancelability from, like, philosophy of language and uh, linguistics and doing uh, somewhat similar stuff with it that uh, some of the other papers I've read recently I've been doing. It's like, well, why does it look like we can't, uh, when we appear to contradict ourselves, what's going on there? And this is like looking at the cancelability of certain things. Like, why can't you slightly, why can't we slightly sort of discount what we just uh, said? Whereas we can always slightly try to bolster what we just said. Um, and that's the canceling, what we just said, the cancelability of things. Um, how do we explain that? Okay, so, well, this... I mean, I guess they've got, what was it, the context, we've got the, uh... The, so then there was the four theories up here. Was it up here? Where was that? Yeah, so we've got these, um... Yeah, and so the problem with, I mean, my problem with this stuff is that I, 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 justified true belief drives me mad. So it's like this right here. 
justification. I don't want to hear that justification stuff. Um, follow the stand of justification. Uh, absence. So, like, these two have sta fallible standards of justification. And the same with the so infallible standard of just, justification. So, absolute certainty. But this is, again, your justification is here. Um, and then, yeah. Me a little, uh, so, <laughs> this is me being grumpy again, but, like, I just this sort of stuff, uh, this method of argumentation based on this sort of background i don't think you're going to get anywhere because you got some bad concepts of the understanding of justification uh built in and so it drives me a little uh it, well, it makes me it un un unsettles my argumentation because I, I just don't think in these terms so i have a hard time uh, reprocessing what's going on in some of this stuff but that's okay i hope you enjoyed it um if you have any questions, let me know. Um, that's about it for today. Or no, I'll be back later today. But that's a bit about it for now. Uh, yeah. So this is just again good paper. Just uh, coming at the similar problem to how we understand our knowledge from a different uh, angle. But that's it. Stay safe, everyone. Have a good day, and I'll be back later.